Hey everybody, in today's video, I wanted to do kind of like a full review and critique of Varlamore. And I know that this is only part one of many. There are future updates coming to sort of supplement Varlamore. I still think it's important to give a little bit of feedback and kind of present my opinions. Personally, I've engaged with just about every single content in Varlamore, done all the quests. I have like 200 KC of Perilous Moons. I've done like 250 rumors. And while I'm not saying that makes me an expert in Varlamore or anything like that, I still think that, um, you know, I just like to share my opinion, things that I really enjoyed and things that I'd like to see kind of change moving forward. I will also add that I have not completed the Coliseum. So if you think that dismisses my opinion, that's fine. You, you don't have to watch this video. My general key for this kind of outline that I'm doing is green is things that are great, things I'd like to see kind of emulated moving forward. And that I think are amazing, um, kind of like good examples of, you know, good content. Blue is minor issues, things that uh, I don't think are really like a game changer or anything like that, but just just little things that I kind of didn't like. Yellow is buggy or lacks quality assurance. There's quite a little bit of things here that feel like they are just bugs or that they were kind of missing a little bit of polish. Uh, and I don't really necessarily want to say that those ruin the entire experience. It just feels like they should probably be addressed and they very, at the very least, they kind of hinder it. And finally, red is going to be for things that I think are either unfinished or underwhelming. These are things that, while I may have had fun with them, they still feel a little bit undercooked, and I would like to see them developed a little bit further. Again, this is kind of the issue with multiple parts of Varlamore, is that I don't know if these things are going to be iterated on uh, and expanded in future, or if they're just going to essentially uh, leave it as is and just move on um, to other things. The things in red, I think, do need to be addressed, though, or I think they're going to very quickly kind of run into issues uh, moving forward. In general, I do want to say that I've absolutely loved Varlamore. It's been an absolutely amazing kind of like area expansion. It reminds me a lot of like when a new expansion in an MMO comes out, like World of Warcraft, and you're there, you know, you're playing. There's like so much to do, so much to see. However, you do have to also realize that, um, you know, one big update it has to come with a little bit more scrutiny than, you know, a lot of really tiny small updates, because I think those are allowed to be a little bit more unpolished. But when you kind of release a massive thing, um, you know, it should be kind of full and complete and there shouldn't be uh, too many holes in it. So let's just go down the list. Timestamps will be in the description for every single section. Okay, so first up, atmosphere and environment was amazing. It was absolutely beautiful. And I really enjoyed just getting to walk around Varlamore, the city of Civilis El Fortis. They did a really, really good job, I think, of capturing what I kind of expected. This like beautiful new city that's a little bit distant. And I also really liked how much uh, extra stuff there was there to kind of walk around. So in particular for me, when I was walking through Outer Fortis, like just outside the gates and you're like walking through all the farm fields, I don't know why, but that just, it kind of captured me. It, it felt really good. It felt kind of like alive, not just um, a map sort of created to do content on. It has a very distinct theme, but it's not otherworldly. It doesn't feel like it's been imported from a, a different game. It still feels like old school RuneScape. And I think that is so, so important that they managed to capture that um, while still playing around with you know, these like Mayan or Aztec themes, but a little bit of Roman stuff with the Colosseum. It just, I really loved it. I, I thought it was absolutely great. Um, honestly, the visuals have just been stunning for the vast majority of it. Uh, and I really like just kind of walking around there. I also like that there's a lot of like secrets and little references to stumble into. Um, I think people have done a very good job of documenting them, so I don't need to list them all here. But even, you know, just little things like you like see a capybara with like an orange on its head. I don't know why, but just little things like that, I think are just like, they kind of add a little bit of life to it and just make it feel like there was a lot of work done. Oh, I really like the dogs. Those are always cute. I will say though that there are a little bit too much kind of empty regions, especially over in the Savannah area. I get it. It's a Savannah. It's not supposed to be like brimming with like civilization, but it still feels a little bit too vast and too big between like these very limited hunter spots. I don't think I would mind this as much if there was more hunter spots, but there's literally like one antelope spot and one pyre fox spot and just a lot of nothing in between. There's not even like I felt like I could have done a little bit better making like little hunter camps or just something like that. And in addition, I think the entire southern coast, um, basically all of that area of the savannah just feels very underused. This is, again, one of those things where I'm not sure if this is a mistake or it's just something that's going to be iterated on further. In particular, I want to draw attention to the Colossal Worm Agility course, um, which is kind of just hanging out there, but it's not really being used. Um, you don't really have a reason to go there. I know that that was, I think, intent, or I think it was originally supposed to be in part one, and then that got moved. So this is what I mean by some stuff 
I'm not sure if it's cut content that's just saved for later and we're going to get it later or if it's just a mistake. Uh, I'm, but again, I'm trying to judge it as you know a product as what it is now. I did also want to talk about clues here because I really didn't know where else to put them. Uh, these are kind of weird. There were a lot of new clues. And first off, it's a little shocking that they would add it like right now, right away. Uh, but also some of these have really crazy requirements relative to their level. So in particular, the elite one, there is an elite clue that requires you to have the full Sunfire Fanatic gear, which is very, very expensive and very difficult to acquire on your own. So if you get this clue, you're kind of screwed. Uh, there's also an easy clue that requires you to enter the Hunter's Guild, and that actually requires 46 Hunter. You might think 46 Hunter is not a big requirement, but for an easy clue, it actually kind of is. Um, and so it just felt a little bit out of place. So yeah, that was just like one little downside I had. Okay, moving on to quests. There are four new quests added with Varlamar, and overall, I really enjoyed them. Um, I guess there's actually technically five. There was Children of the Sun, um, but that was kind of like a prereq quest. It was like a five minute quest just to get you there. So I kind of lumped it in together with Twilight's Promise, which was kind of the, the real like introduction quest to uh, Varlamor and to the town of Civilis El Fortis. Personally, I thought it was a great intro and it gives you a nice, natural, light exploration of the area. You get to go to a couple of the hubs and, you know, just kind of walk around it just a little bit. Um, it doesn't feel forced like Client of, Client of Karen does. Um, if you remember when you first go to Zaya, you have Client of Karen, which has you going to um, all five of the general stores. And I've always kind of hated that quest because it felt like just an excuse to have you walk around, whereas here it I mean, it is an excuse to have you walk around, but but there is actually an, a, there is a quest to it. There is some kind of story to it. You're actually doing stuff. Um, again, Klein of Karen kind of feels like when you're at the zoo and you got to get like the stamps from every single like exhibit. So um, yeah, I really, really like what they did here. I also thought it was incredibly fun to do on release with like no guide. Everything made perfect sense. Um, I didn't really struggle with finding anything. I think that I... Yeah, I think I like couldn't find the dock at first, but then like I realized that a Cathon is a dock, but that's about it. Um, I really like that there were like no random items required. I think when you're going to do this like intro quest, it's nice not to have to like, oh, shoot, I need like a knife or I need a needle. Uh, that's a really good thing. And it helps a lot when you have these like sort of intro quests. Please do more of that. Uh, I will say here just as a little bit of a slight for Children of the Sun, no more stealth sections. Um, I don't enjoy them. I, I don't know who does, but personally, I, I'm just not a big fan. Next up, Perilous Moons. This is the quest. I'm going to be talking about kind of the boss and the area a little bit later. Right now, I'm just focusing on the quest itself. I really like that there was like a very natural progression from Twilight's Promise. Um, it takes you over to Rallus's Rise and the Tiamat, so you're kind of there anyways. It's almost like, you know, it, it almost encourages you to go and do that quest. Again, I didn't have any issues with the quest at all. I did it right on release. Um, and I really enjoyed that feeling of going into the caverns for like the very first time when you get the chance to like explore and sort of map it out in your head, kind of figure out like which which regions go where and stuff like that, like or like kind of like what doorways go where. I think it was cool to kind of get a chance to do that. And then like you always I, I feel like you always know that you're like leading up to that boss fight. So it's kind of this like very cool experience of actually going and setting up all the camps. I like that it teaches prep for you know, the actual boss itself without making it like blatantly spoon fed. Um, in this case, I give the example of Temple of the Eye because I don't know if I really like quests where it feels like the entire quest is just go and do the mini game or go and do the raid. And uh, in Temple of the Eye's case, you're literally talking to NPC after every single thing to the point where it's like, okay, please just like, I get it. Just let me play the game now. Uh, one thing that I'm not sure if I like here is locking Camtorum behind 48 Slayer. So Camtorum is the... Um, Dwarven Town that's under Rallus's Rise. And uh, I don't believe you can actually get in there unless you've started Perilous Moons, which requires 48 Slayer. It also requires a couple other things like level 10 fishing. But 48 Slayer is a lot steeper requirement there. And this is like to kill the Sulfur Nagua. This also locks kind of the whole town as well as the Calcified Rocks, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and I think this is a little bit unnecessarily done. I think they could have easily just made it so that Camtorum is open and you can go explore it but actually getting into um like the perilous moons dungeon that's going to require 48 slayer uh otherwise it just kind of sucks that the calcified rocks are basically locked there's also a wine shop in there that's really cool and a furnace and anvil um that i really liked and kind of just sucks that like 48 slayers it's a little steep that being said maybe this was done intentionally because they don't want people doing calcified rocks uh before 48 slayer next up at first light this is the hunter guild quest where you're helping fox i really like that this quest is only an unlock for master tier rumors it does not actually unlock the hunter guild entirely which means that if you want to you don't have to do this quest you can actually run straight to the hunter guild and start rumors i really really like that that like that you know it doesn't there doesn't always need to be a quest that like 
leads you into the activity. Sometimes you can just go do the activity. The quest itself, though, felt very shallow. Um, I think I expected more of a great hunt, especially because like it unlocks master rumors. So, you know, I think I was I think I was expecting a bit more of like a cooler hunter style quest. And in reality, it actually felt more of a like an herbal quest. Um, I compared a lot to Jungle Potion because it really felt like most of the time spent in that quest was like running around like gathering different herbs. And that's kind of it. There's nothing else to it. The only hunter you end up doing is catching two Jerboas for their tails. These are like the little rats that you'll find. And it was a little bit weird that they tell you to catch one and they tell you at the like very end of the quest when you're like fixing the bed that you also need one more. So it was like, oh shoot, so I caught one. Now I gotta go back. Again, a bit of a nitpick here, but it just felt like they could have told me that earlier and I could have caught, I, I, like, I don't even mind catching five. It just felt like I was running back and forth. Um, that's made even worse by the entire uh, Atsa section. This is when you go talk to the lady who has the fur and you need to like clean up her house that has some construction stuff that you have to do. This kind of felt to me like it was cut content or that there was just some part missing. I think I was really excited when you had to like go get the fur because I thought, oh, this is gonna be like the Slayer or this is gonna be like a new hunter creature that I have to go hunt. Maybe there's like something interesting you have to do. Maybe it's like, uh, one of those jaguars that like attacked fox uh, and no it doesn't end up being like that i actually thought it might be one of the alpacas or something like that you have to go talk to the alpacas uh but no you just talk to her and she just gives you the fur basically after like doing some like construction work <laughs> on her house in all honesty um even though the quest isn't this way it kind of did feel like just a cheap way to get you over to the hunter guild and introduce rumors and uh, i really kind of feel like this was missed opportunity i would have much rather have seen like a more structured a more developed hunter guild quest and one more thing that's a little bit one more thing that's a little bit rough here is that it does also force you into completing eagle's peak because you have to do eagle's peak to use box traps to catch the jerboa tails and this actually will unlock chins for when you later do rumors chins aren't necessarily a bad task but they are one of the slower tasks and i think this kind of runs into a couple issues once you start doing the hunter rumor system um, and you might actually regret having done eagle's peak it's kind of like in slayer when you do for example when you start dragon slayer now you can get dragons as a slayer task uh, it might be in your interest to not do dragon slayer and i i kind of regretted it in, in some ways because I, because I didn't realize the ramifications of unlocking chins for the hunter rumor tasks later on. Okay, and the last one, riveting tale of a lily pad labor dispute. This is the frog quest. You guys should absolutely do it. Very nice, cute, short and sweet quest. Absolutely love it. I like that it has good dialogue and good references. So it's not just like a complete like boring quest. There are some pretty funny rumors and there's like some good, good references, um, good dialogue. If you actually go and talk to people outside of the quest and stuff like that, um, not just like, you know, follow the quest helper to a T. I like that there's an actual reason to go and do it. It's not just like a small five minute quest that just exists just to like exist. Um, it does unlock the hardwood tree. This is teaks and mahoganies. There's immediately you're like kind of drawn to it, like, oh, I should go do that. And also, like, there's a reward for it as well. So I like that. Um, my only complaint about those, I think it was just missing one level of complexity. Again, I know it's not supposed to be something too complicated, but uh, I think there's only really one puzzle, which was trying to, like, figure out what the um, the password to their, like, chest was. But I think it was really obvious to figure out. And um, I think it just could have done with, like, something else or just, like, one more thing. I, just, I think I was just missing, like, an aha moment where I'm like, oh, I figured out how to do this. It was... Uh, yeah, it was, it was a little too obvious. Uh, yeah, if, I think if you boil it down outside of the dialogue, it's a pretty, I guess, like pretty simple quest. There's really nothing going. Again, it's it's a minor issue, so don't worry about it too much. It's a good quest. All right, moving on to skilling methods. So this is basically every new skilling method that kind of Varlmar has introduced. Um, it's really, really encouraging to see good new methods that aren't just mini games to fix bad skills. I think that there has been a bit of a weird streak where like a lot of the new sort of patches to skills is like oh let's just add a mini game that you can do from like level 20 to level 99 and i don't really like that i think that we could actually just make good skills so camtorum and the calcified rocks i'm talking a little bit about camtorum here uh, i personally felt like this was perfectly balanced um it was nice and afk but you weren't getting like some crazy crazy rates while doing the calcified rocks um also if you wanted to you can tick manipulate you can do like 1.5 tick for like some crazy rates uh borderline busted prey rates honestly but uh we'll see i don't think it's too bad the best way i can compare it is it's it felt very much like mother load mind to me where you're kind of chill for about 30 to 45 seconds this one's a little bit longer you go about a minute afk and instead of getting any kind of resources or the uniques that you would find in a mother load mine so um you know the coal bag the prospector outfit 
you're instead getting the prayer experience and that's kind of the draw to go ahead and do this you're still going to have to do mother load mine it's not completely replacing that um it's just a different way of kind of getting your mining up in a bit of a more afk way that's not just like shooting stars <laughs> all the way so i really like this method i think it's great i also like that it is a bit of a dual skilling method because you are banking some prayer experience as well so even if the mining isn't you know completely optimal you can you can kind of like make that decision and i think dual skilling methods are a nice way of inserting like new powerful skilling methods that don't just like completely objectively beat out or like power creep um already existing methods so, so yeah it's it's cool when you can find something that's not like best but it's, it's efficient when you're thinking about both of them as i mentioned before camtorum is locked behind 48 slayer which i don't think was necessary because this essentially cuts calcified rocks behind 45 48 slayer as well the prayer method already requires 30 prayer so it's not like you can go and just start collecting bone shards at like level one um i, I can understand if that was a problem people are literally just like booking it here like right at level one and they're like training their prayer all the way to 43 it, it, you already need to get 30 prayer one way so um it's not like you can do this right off the gate I, I think 48 slayer is a little bit too restrictive the waterfall effect just doesn't feel worth it um i think it's supposed to be like 15 percent better success reward this is when you go out of your way to like collect the like the waterfall veins at the time um even when it's not bugged, because it does bug all the time, and I'll tell you, like, your your pickaxe is too slippery, um, and you can't mine as much, and then you get, like, no rewards. <laughs> Even when that's not happening, um, because the fix is really awkward, you have to, like, go all, all the way to Varlamore and pickpocket wealthy citizens, so it's kind of a mess. It definitely feels like it is not working as intended. Yeah, it just doesn't feel like, I don't, I don't feel that much better about the waterfall. Uh, personally, I don't even know if I super despise it because i just stopped caring i just stopped caring about it at all like i don't even look for it anymore but yeah i don't know i'm, I'm very conflicted because like i i just don't care about it that much because it just doesn't feel like it's doing all that much so um i don't know maybe they could add it as like a bit more a bit more give it a little bit more like oomph to reward players for not just like completely being afk one thing i really like about cam torum is that there's a lot of ways to actually arrive there um so you right from the get-go basically once you twilight's promise you have the the capsule that will take you over to the teal mat like on top of Ralph's rise and you can like walk down you can take the agility path which i think is a little bit faster you can also build the uh, like a faster landing spot for the Quetzal that's like right outside of Camtorum. And you can take that a step further and get calcified moths through calcified rocks. This takes you like right outside the bank and uh, very, very, very close to uh, Perilous Moons. So I like that there's multiple ways to arrive there that kind of make you uh, kind of like, there's like a choice to be made. The calcified moths are one time use. So if you want that really, really fast instant teleport to Camtorum, you have to go farm it um, from calcified rocks or, you know, stock up on some by some from the grand exchange i also like that camtorum in general feels complete it is actually like a, a city of its own um this update could have completely functioned with with civilis el fortis and the rest of arlmar could not have existed this mountain could have just been added with camtorum and still would have felt great um i like that it's not just a lobby for perilous moons there's also the skilling method i think i mentioned before there's a wine shop and a furnace and anvil in there as well so that's kind of cool i really like that um yeah, I, I like that a lot. Okay, so moving on to Rallus's Rise or the Blessed Bone Shards. This is basically the prayer method. Um, I see this as a better, like, modern version of the Ectofuntus. Basically, you have to process bones that you can process into, like, a much more efficient experience per bone. It just takes a little bit more time to actually uh, break it down and see those, like, prayer gains, basically. I think the Sunfire Splinters are a wonderful addition. Um, you get 20% bonus by using them, and it doesn't like massively consume them, so you should absolutely do it. At first, when I read about this, I was uh, very much like, oh, why does it have to be so complicated? Like, you have to get wine, and then you have to add it with the Sunfire Splinters, which you go far. And it didn't feel that way at all in practice. I felt like you could very easily get a whole bunch of Sunfire Splinters, um, especially since Wave 1 of the Coliseum is very easy to do, or you could get it through Antelopes if you don't want to step foot into the Coliseum. So it's not actually that hard to get Sunfire Splinters, and they're basically, it's basically the freest extra prayer experience you could ever get. So, yeah. Make sure you guys are doing Sunfire Splinters. I also like that there's kind of additional steps of efficiency by, you know, you can bring uh, prayer pots over to the Libation Bowl. So um, typically, if you go to the Libation Bowl, it drains like prayer every time you sacrifice some. And there's like an altar that's right there. You just kind of run to it. It doesn't take very long time at all. But if you want to, you could bring a prayer potion um, just to speed things up ever so slightly. And um, I kind of like when there's those like, there's like, 
like I would say like it's like two percent more efficient or like three percent more efficient where it feels like it's not necessary to do if you just want to be lazy if you don't care um but you know you can take that extra step if you really want to speed things up it's also really nice that you can uh, afk it and just kind of let it go or you can like spam click the bull to process all of your bone shards a little bit faster it's a lot better than the ectofuntus where if you want to speed things up at the ectofuntus it is a nightmare oh and they allow you to buy infinite jugs of wine just downstairs um, in Camtorum. So, yeah, that's really damn good. That's amazing that uh, I don't have to, you know, like buy wines in other places. It's, it's already right there. I really love that you can actually just stock up on a whole ton of bone shards and then process them. I'm sure Ultimate Iron Man are uh, drooling at the mouth over this update. But it's nice that, like, you know, I, I can just get a whole bunch of the bone shards, process them uh, when I feel like it. And when I actually do get to that stage when I'm like processing, you know, like, 20 30 thousand bone shards it's really damn nice you get those like massive massive prayer gains and i i very much enjoy that i actually don't have to go to the wildy altar because even as a main i still feel like right now i'm very much tempted to go to um rouse's rise and basically grind everything down into bone shards just because like the wildy altar is nice and i don't want to take its place as like the most efficient thing but man, there's just some times where I want to train my prayer and I just don't want to deal with getting PK'd. And I never should feel like I have to go to the wildy because it's just so damn good that every other method is like completely irrelevant. Um, if you compare the wildy altar to the gilded altars that you can find in somebody's player own house, basically, if you lost like half of your inventory every single time, the wildy altar would still be better than the gilded altar. So um, yeah, it's kind of like a no brainer to be using the wildy altar. At least here, I think it gets close enough where I'm like, eh, I don't know if I want to go to the Wildy today. Maybe I'll just do Bone Shards instead. It's, it comes out to around like 500% bone efficiency compared to 700% the Wildy Altar. So I like that. Okay, a couple negatives here. Sunkissed Bones. I don't know why these exist. Um, pretty much everything that drops Sunkissed Bones also drops Bone Shards. So um, I think they, they could just entirely get rid of this item and just convert it to Bone Shards and... It would still be fine, but maybe there's something coming up for it that I'm missing. There's a uh, inconsistent conversion for bones to bone shards that can make it a little bit hard to actually know how much you're getting. Um, so a good example of this is most items convert to about 500%. Technically, it's 483%. Um, but the new Wormling bones, these are a very like low prayer experience item. They actually convert to 600% prayer experience when you convert them to bone shards. And um, I don't know why that inconsistency is there. It's, it's kind of weird that like I feel like I have to go through like a whole calculator to like figure out what's going on. I also think that there's a possible problem with like every single method in Varlamore giving you passive prayer that could very easily hit a breaking point where like prayer just becomes like almost like a zero time skill that you could just get by doing everything else. Um, mining gives a lot. Perilous Moons gives a lot. The Hunter's Guild gives quite a bit. And uh, Viral More Thieving gives, you know, a, a, a tiny amount. But yeah, I I, um, I think it's okay where it's at right now. But if they add any more methods, I think they got to be really damn careful about adding prayer everywhere. Uh, I know that most people would love it because, you know, free prayer, that's whatever. But uh, you are taking away a pretty massive portion of the game by essentially uh, reducing or like taking away the need to like grind any prayer. Um, I think you could also argue that there's uh, value in choosing to, you know, go for certain methods like calcified rocks because that gives you prayer. Um, but again, why would you even do that if you could just like do Hunter instead? Okay, Varl and more thieving. This is the new thieving activity. Uh, this is basically the first like thieving activity that really stuck with me. I There's so much different things, so many different like thieving mini games. And honestly, I just never really liked any of them. Uh, but to me, this is the first one that felt like there was the right amount of like attention or focus and no spam clicking. Typically, I really dislike thieving because it puts it kind of strains my wrist a lot and I just end up getting really, really sick of it. And I kind of have to like stomach it or force myself into it because the experience rates are so high. And that's kind of why I think a lot of people um, don't treat thieving as like one of the worst skills in the game. I think if thieving was like half the experience rate or like as bad as agility, it would easily be one of the worst skills in the game. And everybody would agree on that. There's a really awesome feel to thieving of like getting into the house and escaping um i just don't know why but i love the rush out and it's not even that bad to get caught uh, initially i was a little bit worried because i thought it would be kind of like stressful to like keep up and you know um 
make sure you don't like leave. But even if you do get caught, you just lose some valuables. It's really not the end of the world. You still get all the experience. So it, yeah, it's just not a big deal. I, I I really enjoy that, that the punishment's not that much. Sound cues here really help a lot by making it easy to know when the um, guy is coming back. It's good to know when you need to switch to like the prize possession that's kind of shining in the house and stuff like that. Um, and it's also good with the wealthy citizens because you can just li- you can listen to the notification of the wealthy citizens. Um, in fact, it's actually a little bit annoying sometimes because if you're at the Southeast house, you get the notification of the wealthy citizen getting attracted by the urchin and sometimes like that's actually kind of baited me sometimes um i don't know if they could possibly fix this but it tripped me up a couple times i also want to say that this was an amazing social experience the first week first couple of days when i was doing this there's so many people and you know everybody has to leave the house at the same time it's like this like swarm of like cockroaches running out it was really really cute i don't know why i just really loved it and i had this like very cool moment where one guy starts walking up to the door and he's dressed as like the NPC. And then he says the line about getting keys and like half the people in the house like booked it out because they thought that that was the actual NPC showing up to the house. Um, and everybody else just started laughing. It was, it was really, really fun. And I wish I could recapture that. I almost would love to see like a shared world. Um, I don't think every single activity needs to have a shared world, but like this one in particular was just so, so fun to me to do with other activities. As for the actual wealthy citizens themselves, I think I've learned from this that like pickpocketing just really, really sucks and I hate it. Um, however, trickster pocketing, this is like the AFK, you just auto pickpocket over and over again with no failure. Uh, that's great. I, I love that. That's amazing. And as it kind of turned out that the more I started doing um, Varl more thieving, the more I realized that I'd rather just spend my time like fletching or alking or, you know, training crafting and just waiting for the urchin in the downtime. And once the urchin attracts them, I'll just go ahead and pickpocket it and just do stuff in the meantime instead of uh, even bothering with getting stunned. I don't know if this was intended or not, but this is way more fun for me. It was way more tolerable and I could actually like do other stuff in the meantime. I would like to see some more ways of actually getting these triggers, something to kind of do in your downtime um, to, you know, get the urchins to go more rather than just wait. Even if it means getting less experience, I just kind of like the idea of like having something to do to speed it up. One thing I think could be work would like turn in some amount of valuables. It could even be like a pretty big number, maybe like a thousand or something like that. And you have an urchin distract. And uh, this could also be for everybody in the world and, and kind of make it a bit of a social exper- experiment where everybody has to sort of contribute some of their valuables and pay some gold. Um to kind of give everybody a chance for more house keys. Uh, and this isn't even really my idea. I think they actually planned on doing something where you like you get like napkins or something like that and you turn those in to make the urchin distract. I think this is actually the intended behavior that was either cut or removed. Not sure why. You can also fish for the keys, which I like as having like an AFK way of getting the keys. If you really can't, like if you just can't stomach pickpocketing, uh, you can just go do that instead. Um, also, those fishing spots, I believe, give you like some pretty decent gems like red topazes and stuff like that. So it's kind of a cool way of getting that if like you don't have access to like an Amulet of Glory or you don't want to go like do Shiloh Village and all that stuff. For a couple of weird things here, I think the increased price of valuables. So typically every valuable you turn in is 55, but you can make this 65 if you complete enough of the Colosseum and it just feels like way too much glory. I don't think people who are competent enough at the Colosseum (laughs) need like the 20% more uh, gold that you're getting from pickpocketing. It's like, it's only like 100K an hour. So um, it's a really minor buff. And if they're gonna add glory to these, like what I would consider like a fairly mid game activity, because this only requires level 50 thieving, I think that they should have put down the glory a lot, like like complete wave three or something like that. It just feels a little bit too much. Uh, and then finally, there is also the same debuff that you get while doing the calcified rocks. This You get like sweaty hands or you're too tired to pickpocket. I think this is to combat like world hop but honestly it just kind of never works. I think the way it's supposed to and uh, I would just I hope they just scrap it entirely if and you know they could just make all the urchins global on every single world that way you can't like world hop between every single one of them i don't know if this would work but uh, i don't know this thing needs to get fixed it feels like it's just not working right at all even after the fix quick mention of sunfire runes and searing pages basically this is um you use sunfire splinters to make the sunfire runes and this gives your fire hits like a 10 percent to the minimum hit i don't think these are super useful they don't really feel that worth it and their price is going to be held up um, for quite a while because of the demand for splinters so it's not like you can get these for like dirt cheap splinters are kind of retaining their price right now because people need them for other activities mainly to charge quivers so for the time being i just don't see a use for these 
Um, it was really cool at first to see that they were like a brand new runecrafting method, like a surprisingly efficient one. Uh, and then they axed that. So I guess they don't really want that. And um, that kind of sucks. So, you know, rip, rip runecrafting. Moving on the hunter guild and the rumor system. You might be surprised that I have this in red because I have done a lot of hunter. In fact, I enjoy the hunter rumor system quite a bit, but it feels very much unfinished and I think it needs a little bit more work. The best way I can describe the hunter guild is it's very unintuitive. There's a lot that I think you need to know to kind of get the juice out of the hunter guild and actually enjoy it. And uh, when I first walked in there, when I first started doing rumors, I did them for like two hours and I was like, man, this is like, this is pretty bad. <laughs> like I, I don't enjoy doing this. Uh, it's not fun. I'm, I'm basically just here because it's, it's like varied content, but like I should just be doing like red chins or, or literally any other like decent hunter method. And that sucks. That sucks that my first impression was so, so bad because there is a really, really fun gameplay loop. Once you actually pass through some hurdles and you kind of understand all the mechanics, um, this is another weird instance where it's really hard for me to say what is intended and what is a bug or hidden technique that wasn't supposed to happen. So um, this very, very fun gameplay loop, um, which does exist. It, it is really fun once you get there. I'm not sure if that was like a happy accident or actually like in the intended behavior that they just made a little bit too convoluted. So I think a lot of people kind of gave up before they, they even got there as basic core. Uh, hunter rumors are basically slayer or farming contracts for hunter. It's a very, very simple concept. And I think that's easy to understand by everybody. Um, that being said, I'm really happy that's not that simple because I think slayer has a bit of complexity to it. Farming contracts have a bit of complexity to it with like pre-planting. I'm glad that there are a couple of mechanics to make things a little bit easier. However, I think that complexity is uh, pretty difficult to understand. And if you're just kind of going on your own, you don't not watching like a video or like reading the wiki about how to do stuff, uh, you're probably just not going to even figure out this stuff. So there's like three major techs that speed up the hunter guild. I'm not going to do a full list about them. I've kind of talked about them in like multiple videos now, but uh, just a quick summary. We got blocks. This is very easy to understand. Um, it helps a lot and feels natural due to Slayer. Basically, no two no two um, hunter masters or whatever can have the same task. So you can get a task from somebody else and then uh, you're better, like your master, or your expert task, they won't be able to get that one. This allows you to essentially block tasks. And I think this feels very intuitive because of things like Slayer and it is a pretty beneficial thing. Uh, next up, Kebit Swaps. This is probably the one that I am most hesitant to, to rate because I have no idea if it is intended. I would probably bet that it's not or it was a mistake, but it also has like the biggest benefits. This is probably getting closest to like exploiting a bug, um, but I haven't seen any comments on it yet. So it's really hard for me to say. Uh, Kevin swapping is by far the most game changing purely because it gets rid of bad tasks. And there are a lot of bad tasks that like diminish the hunter experience by so much that I really think that if Kevit swapping did not exist, um, I probably would not do hunter at the adept and expert level. And finally, we got temporary rerolls, which is by far the most confusing and unintuitive. Basically, if you don't get a new contract and then you talk to somebody who already had an existing contract, it will reroll their task, but only once. And if you talk to anybody else, it'll go back to their original one, which is uh, it's very strange and I think a lot of people get caught up in it and they mess up their block list because they accidentally hit the temporary reroll but it's not actually their permanent reroll and then when they talk to somebody else thinking that they got the task it's not actually that so yeah it's very very weird but it's also the one that I think was intended because I feel like they wanted this they wanted some way to reroll I'm not even sure again this is just me taking a guess okay so just some lessons to be learned from these because even though I don't think these three texts are necessary, I do think that they show a lot about why a hunter system is lacking and what should kind of be done to make it a little bit more fun. Uh, for blocks, it would be really nice to actual to like to have act like some actual like block or skip system similar to Slayer that requires investment, that requires you to build it, that you can manipulate and um, do yourself. I very much enjoy like going through the earlier like tasks to build the block list you want. And then like you finally get the right task you want. And you're like, all right, I don't have to talk to this guy. I can go to the higher tier rumors and I can absolutely blast. That was actually really fun to do. Didn't take me too long, only like two to three hours, which you know, I, I think I got a little bit lucky. But even if you got unlucky, probably get it done in just a bit of hours. And it'll spend a lot like it'll speed you up in the grand scheme of things. And it reminded me a lot of, you know, when you're going to Slayer and you're doing some of the like tutorial skipping, um, 
getting the blocks, getting the extends, getting the unlocks, all that stuff. It, it felt kind of like that to, to really speed it up once you've sort of completed the like early game, so to speak, of this uh, activity. I would really like to see more rewards for static rumor completions that are actually tied to this. Um, as it stands right now, the current rewards feel way too shallow and way too short. So it, the highest one that you can get is at 50 rumors. You can cook every single one of the new hunter meats. Um, and I think I would have enjoyed it if the static rumor completion was actually tied to creating like a block system instead. Um, I don't think it should be like, you know, a one to one copy of Slayer where it's like, oh, every every time you do a rumor, you get like five points. And when you collect like 50 points, you could skip a test. But maybe like every 50 or something, you could get a block and that could go up to like 200 or something like that, because capping out at 50 rumors just feels too small. And then it's sort of like, oh, well past that what do, what am i even doing this for and really all you're doing it for is i guess the hunter outfit uh and as well as like the pet if you want to get that um again it would be cool to see if the hunt i'd like to see the hunter outfit actually come from static rumor completions maybe you get one piece every 100 so that means 400 rumors you've kind of completed it honestly that's probably faster than what most people are getting right now um and at the very least i like deterministic grinds as opposed to like fully rng grinds you could also add things like cosmetics and stuff like that maybe like uh cosmetics to the the ketson like the pet the whistle blueprint is also a reward from the rumors that feels more or that's like a that's a reward from like static rumors but that feels more of like a dry prevention not like a chase goal like by the time you get to like 250 rumors completed you probably should have already gotten at least one perfect uh blueprint so yeah it just feels like like okay like well if you haven't gotten this far all right we'll give you one think of like the calphite head uh or vorkath head you know it's like a guaranteed thing if you've gone really really dry kebit swapping has kind of convinced me that deadfall and tracking just sucks so this is why the kebit swaps are so good because you don't have to do saber tooth kebits and you don't have to do any of the tracking ones also if you missed it kebit swapping just means that if you get one of the bad kebit tasks you can instead uh grab a different taskmaster who has like one of the falconry tasks typically and um you could swap to them grab the kebity tuft and that unique item is still the same for every kebit then if you swap back to saber tooth kebits or whatnot um you could turn it in as if you had completed that so that's what kebit swapping is i, I have videos about it if you'd like as i said before hunter's guild would be a lot worse with kebit swapping gone um to a point where i think it would be borderline unplayable i think that i would basically not do much <laughs> if any hunter rumors just because uh the for me personally, when you hit one of those really slow deadfall or tracking tasks, so this would be like saber tooth kebits or like razor barbed kebits or um, any of those, they just make me not want to do it. I feel like I'm literally sitting there for like half an hour at a time just watching, you know, my boulder up there. And I, I just, I very quickly, I'm like, I'm just wait, I'm sitting here wasting time for no reason at all. The tasks are slow with not much activity. Most of it is you're just you're just sitting there doing nothing, a lot of downtime. They give low experience and there's also no rewards. So it's not like you're hunting like red chins, for example, where you're actually getting something from doing red chins or a useful item. It's like the unholy trinity of a bad task. And um, even even one or two of these just like completely kills it for the day for me. I just don't want to do any hunter once I hit one of these. Finally, I think that some way to reroll is absolutely necessary. Um, with enough focus and attention on this mechanic, I think that you could honestly even get rid of kebit swapping and blocks. Um, you should still probably get rid of all the deadfall ones though, if I'm being honest. But I think just having some way to reroll would be really good. There is a built-in reroll system with the novice guy. You can talk to the novice guy and he will reset every single task, but you have to do whatever he gives you. And this feels like it's more of a last resort. I don't think that this is intended for you to basically hit the task until you get stuff you don't like, and then you do the novice guy, and then you try again, and then you do the novice guy. I don't think that because essentially at that point it's just Turiel skipping. Um, it's a, it's like Turiel skipping by Hunter, and uh, I, I don't think that that was intended. I, I yeah, I would like to see some new like reroll system. The most basic one that I can imagine is like when you go to get a task, especially for adept and expert, because there's already two of them anyways. They give you two options, and you have to pick one. And then once you complete that one, they both reroll. So let's say it gives you red chins and it gives you saber tooth kebits. You're going to do the red chins and then they both reroll. As it stands right now, you complete the red chins and you still have that kebit basically just sitting there waiting for you to eventually say, all right, well, I'll do it now, I guess, because it just sucks, you know, and and I don't I don't think that's good. I, I think they should both reroll. You should have a way of rerolling them. The current reroll system is very, very unintuitive, and I think it should be you should just get rid of it so a big problem with the hunter rumor system is the variance in hunter tasks 
the difference between a bad task and a good task is like way too much. Um, in particular, when we talked about Kebit swapping, Falconry Kebit task can take like literally less than two minutes and just a few catches. I've I consistently get them in like under 10 and it respawns in like five seconds. So it's like, it's very, very fast. I spend more time walking over and talking to Matthias to get the Falcon than actually doing any falconry or any hunter. And all my experience is just coming in from the massive turn in reward that you get at the end. Whereas uh, Chinchampas or Deadfall can take like 30 minutes plus. I've literally sat at some of these for like 30 minutes doing nothing, just waiting to get my item and I can't speed it up or, or do anything i'm literally just sitting there praying on rng and it it's a little ridiculous to me that i've had chinchampa tasks that take 300 and falconry cover tasks that like consistently take less than 10 they take less than five minutes to do it's it's kind of insane to be clear both of these ends of the spectrum are really bad um it shouldn't be the case that there are some tasks that take five minutes and some take tasks that take like 50 minutes that just should not be the case um i don't enjoy doing one task for 50 minutes otherwise i would just go do that task uh, and i don't enjoy literally showing up and getting an item in like two falconry and then having to run all the way back that, that feels very weird to me you might compare this to things like slayer where you know you'll kill like 10 dark beasts and then you'll do like 250 blood velds. Um, I just want to say that that is a choice that you're making to like extend and slaughter blood velds or whatever. And also that you are rewarded for slayer experience based on how long the task is. So it's not like, like I, I think imagine how much weirder it would be if you got the same like bonus completion for doing 10 dark beasts and for doing uh, 270 blood velds. It'd be very awkward. They, you know, they just give experience. There is no flat, completion bonus you get for turning it in. I'd really like to see more consistency in the hunter tasks. I don't think they should all be the exact same, like 10 minutes at a time. Um, but I just think as it stands right now, it's just too much. This is especially true when some tasks are also just worse than others. So for example, going dry on red chins. Okay, I can excuse that. It's good experience and you know, you're getting a good item, so that's fine. But when you're going dry on like butterflies or when you're going dry on deadfall or larupia or kayats things like those that are already pretty slow and they get bad experience and they don't give you a reward again the unholy trinity of a bad task that just i think it kills the whole rumor system really really bad and there has to be something i think to combat that because it's just like even one of those tasks feels like it kills like 10 good tasks basically i think a really good way to combat this um, without just like massively changing all the rates would actually be to make it so that the drop rate was three invisible drops to get the drops this would be similar to the desert uh, Desert Treasure 2 bosses, the Vestiges. I know a lot of people don't like the invisible drops, but I think this is a little bit more excusable since it won't take that long anyways. Uh, you know, it's going to come out to about like 10 minutes or so. Whereas, you know, when you're grinding the ring, you could be there for like 2000 kills and that could take, you know, like 50 hours or so uh, or something like that. When you're grinding it for that long, yeah, you probably want to know how close you are, how much progress you've made. But the kind of benefit of having it split into three invisible drops, um, and it could be visible too, doesn't have to be visible or invisible, uh, but this actually would fix both sides of the problem um, because this sort of squishes the variance. You're not as likely to go dry, but you're also not as likely to go super lucky and like get it in the first three. That's incredibly rare to get in the first three, basically. This would mean that when you show up to a hunter location, you're actually getting some hunter done. You're not just literally hunting like two creatures and porting out. And uh, it also would help that dry prevention. So if you are at like the rate of an item, you're, you're, you're probably going to get it pretty soon. Obviously, you could still go dry. That's fine if they don't want to remove that. And I don't think they should remove it. I don't think that they should have like, go hunt 120 red chins. I don't like that. But I think that this just fixes it. I think master rumors feel like the best balance of this with the exception of pyre foxes. Um, pyre foxes still suck. For a lot of people have asked me like, what's the correct block list for masters? And I really think it comes down to personal preference. There's only 10 tasks. And honestly, I think aside from pyre foxes, they're all pretty decent. Um, and so you can choose to prioritize whatever you personally would like to do, whether that's uh, rumor completions, you know, the fastest task possible for more roles at the pet, whether or not you want to get the best experience tasks this would be things like Irby, which typically Irby is pretty slow. Um, it takes a while to complete, but you get really good experience in doing it. You can prioritize monsters that give you uh, gold and materials. So like the Moonlight Antelope are actually pretty decent profit right now they can give you bolts if you're um, trying to use a sunlight crossbow things like that um, or you could prioritize uh, 
simultaneous pet grinds. This would be Irby and Chins. I know a lot of people really like the idea of doing Red Chin and Irby tasks while doing their rumors because, you know, you're getting two pet grinds in one, which is kind of cool. And that's kind of your choice to make. Personally, again, I don't know what you would block. Uh, it's it's really up to you, I think. Okay, let's move into Hunter Rumors and the rewards. We already talked a little bit about the static rumor completions, and this does not really feel complete. Um, I think there needs to be a little bit more to grind for past that 50. Um, and for me, again, I, I think it's a lot more preferable than having the RNG drops for like every single unique. Um, just having some static thresholds where you're like, oh, I've done 400. That would be awesome. Um, that would just be a lot better. I think the Huntsman's Kit needs to be actually useful. I think they are planning on changing this. Um, but yeah, I think I would rather, I basically would rather have the Huntsman's Kit as well as the outfit pieces be from static rumor completions as opposed to being random. Um, I would also really like for them to do something with the dupe outfit pieces because right now I have like, I have four extra pieces and I have no idea. I have no idea what you're supposed to do with them. Um, they just kind of sit in my bank. Um, if you're going to give me a dupe, you probably should give me something I can do with it. I do think that the secondary rewards feel really damn good. You got birdhouses, logs, herbs. You're getting raw cash, which is really nice and important, as well as bones, which are exclusive to the new prayer method. I like that it's not just like, here's dragon bones. It's here's bones that you have to spend over in Varlamore. I think that's a very nice compromise. Um, this actually makes it a really cool replacement for Iron Man instead of doing early Winter Todd or Thieving because the rumors actually do give you cash. I actually think that early Hunter Rush is really, really tempting now um, for an Iron Man. I'm glad that they did that because obviously I don't really like Winter Todd or Thieving. I really like the new Hunter meat system, um, even though there is you know a bunch of these new meats that you kind of have to deal with. Um, it's a really, really interesting niche because it's technically better than existing food. Uh, but it comes at that cost. The food basically comes in like two spurts. You get an initial heal and then a, a secondary heal, which makes it a little bit worse when you need like burst healing, when you need really, really fast healing. But it ends up being um, a lot more inventory efficient, so to speak. You're getting a lot more healing out of one inventory slot. Uh, and you can also do really cool things with it. Like you can combine um, like a one of the hunter meats with a karambon. You can combo eat them and you'll still get that second heal. So it's kind of like a huge heal and then you still get that little after part. So this puts you out of the danger zone for a lot of bosses while still making like max efficiency uh, from the food that you're eating. And again, manta rays, they still have a place. Like you're still gonna be using manta rays and anglerfish at times. Um, when you really need like burst healing. I like that they also have a variety of uses. It's not just cook and eat. Um, it does give you cooking experience. It's a way for you to get food. However, you can also use the raw food to charge the whistle as well as using it for butterfly mixes. Um, I've talked about these quite a bit, but this is like a new way of getting some super, super cheap prayer potions. Um, and I have found that uh, as much Hunter Rumors as I do, I do run out. If I'm really going hard on the butterfly mixes, I do run out of raw food. So I like that I have to make that choice. Like, do I want to cook this or do I want to keep it raw to use for the moths? Or, you, you know, it, it's, it's fun. I like that. I like when I feel like I have um, sort of an economy to, to, to think about. I don't just have an infinite supply of resource. And I think this is actually reflected. It has retained a pretty decent price, honestly. Um, all the meat still has value. It hasn't like crashed into oblivion. The meat pouch might be a little bit broken though. If you don't know, you can hold like 28 pieces of meat in there and you can actually bring it to like different bosses. I think you can bring it to like God Wars Dungeon. You take it with you to Zolver Trips and then just like cook the food outside. Um, it's kind of like a I dare I say a pack yak almost where you could just have a bunch of extra food. You just have to cook it real quick. Um, this might be broken, but I don't I, I, I don't know. I think it's it extends trips, but you do have to cook it. So I think it's cool for now. Um, but yeah, they might have to like manually fix it so you can only like deposit at a bank or something like that. I, I, I don't know how um, they'll feel about this. I think people just kind of hate the idea of having like a pack yak. So on the other hand, there are some rewards that are pretty lackluster. These are mainly the one time use that you basically, as soon as you get a little bit, you never have to use it ever again. So this is the Quetzal feed. It has like very little value now. Um, it was selling for a lot on like the first couple of days. And I think people realize it's very, very easy to obtain. And uh, most importantly, there's no repeatable use for it. So uh, the demand for it is basically just to build the new landing spots and then it kind of goes away. And this is, this is even more of a problem when there's like oh, really only like two, maybe three useful landing spots. Uh, I think the one at Camptorum is nice. The one at Outer Fortis is nice to get to the Antelope and maybe the Colosseum. Um, the Colossal Worm one is basically useless because that's not in the game yet. Um, there should be more added to the game, but like I think by the time the 
more of them are added to the game, I think this price is going to be like completely worthless because there's going to be so many of them in the market that like if you need to buy like 40 of them or whatever, because remember, it's, it's only 10 per landing spot. So it's actually like a very, very small investment. So, yeah, I just I I have like hundreds of these now <laughs> just sitting in my bank that I don't know what to do with. And it's um kind of sad. I feel like if they wanted to make this like an unlockable thing, I think they could have gone a little bit harder and really made you like invest to get it maybe make it like 30 or 40 i know some of you probably don't like that uh but i think it adds a little bit more value to it and makes it feel good to actually grind it out because you will end up needing like 200 of them uh to make all the spots and they already provide you the one at the hunter guild they already provide you the one at uh tiamat so over in rouse's rise you're already getting like the, you're kind of getting the most important ones already for free so another good use for it could be uh, to use the feed to actually charge the whistle this way. If you don't want to use your meat, because the meat actually has you know, like good uses as like a, you know, for cooking and stuff like that. Instead, you could use the Quetzal feed, even if it only gives like a couple per charge, like two or three, just something to do. In addition, if they wanted to, I think making like pet cosmetics or recolors, this could be a really easy way. And honestly, like you could go nuts here. I think you could have like 200 for a pet cosmetic. That would be great. You can already recolor your bird for free, so it's kind of like missed potential there. But yeah, I think I think just just go wild here. Let people let let the price jack up for all the pet hunters. Why not? Again, if you're doing a lot of rumors, you probably already have a lot of Quetzal feed anyway. So it's not like it's not like they're short on Quetzal feed. <laughs> they got plenty. Okay, so past that, fur is completely useless in this game. I don't know why they didn't do anything to address this. I think it's best shown by the Moonlight Antelope. Uh, their fur right now has absolutely zero purpose. I think it trades for like 10 gold each right now you could sell it for 10 gold um and yeah it's completely useless I don't, I don't think it does anything so this is the new highest level hunter creature in the game which requires 91 hunter and its fur is just it's like a worthless drop it's not even worth picking up um and it's actually made kind of annoying because uh it doesn't get dropped to the floor it actually gets put straight into your inventory i would almost prefer this item not to exist rather than putting a useless item in my inventory every single time i capture um, one of these antelopes so they added a fur pouch and um, it doesn't really do anything at the very least I think that they could add like an auto pickup system that it just automatically puts into your fur pouch um, or honestly again I would just like an option to disable all fur by the way this would be great to do for the meat pouch as well um, like just meat automatically goes into the meat pouch a lot of the hunter right now is just managing your inventory so like when I catch an antelope I have to fill the meat pouch bury the bone chisel the antler and drop the fur I get four items added to my inventory every single time I catch an antelope uh, it could be kind of a lot because I'm also carrying logs and stuff like that so um, yeah anything to help inventory would would be kind of great here so they did add the mixed hide armor which uh, I think is a pretty cool set but you need like I think you only need like a couple sunlight antelope and a couple pyre foxes and then a jaguar, which is even a hunter creature. I think you actually kill it with like combat. So you could probably get this done in like five minutes, honestly. And that's pretty much the only use for the armor set. That's it. It also uses a buyable product. So you're actually more limited by like, I think you have to pay like 10K a piece for the mixed hide base, which you cannot make yourself. You literally buy it at the store. Um, I think that this armor set could have just been sold in the store and there'd be little to no difference because of how little fur it uses. Yeah, fur is just completely worthless. I think there needs to be something to do with the fur. Uh, personally, I think that the easiest way is just give it some kind of crafting pur purpose. This would like compete with dragon hide, for example. A lot of people will get a bunch of dragon hide and make gear. I'm not saying it should give the same experience rates, but like, let's say you collect like a couple hundred or a couple thousand of this. Okay, maybe you can turn this in for some crafting experience. You can make some, I don't know, some antelope cape or something, and it just gives you some decent crafting experience if you want to do it. This could either be, you know, range gear or just an alkable, or honestly, it could just be easy crafting experience that you can bank. Right now, it serves no purpose. I'd also like to see like a Gloves of Silence upgrade. Right now, I think this is the only thing that uses fur and it uses Dark Kevitz, which is like a very like mid-game hunter creature. Imagine if you could upgrade the Gloves of Silence with the Moonlight Antelope fur and create like a super version. I don't know, like a Ring of Suffering version of the Gloves of Silence that you just charge with, um, with furs and it's a lot easier that way. Or just create a whole brand new item. I don't know. They, I feel like they miss potential on being able to do stuff with fur. Regardless of what they do, I think that they need to make fur a lot rarer because right now, every single time you kill a creature, you basically get it guaranteed and it has no use. So it's just a dead item that I, I don't even want. Um, man, if they will, like, honestly, if, if nothing else, just make the fur an alkable if you really want to. Uh, make it like 20K or something like that. But then you could put it at like one in 100 or one in 200. 
that that way like it just feels nice when you get the drop as opposed to like uh oh wow i got another piece of useless fur and every single hunter area has like like 60 of these on the ground because everybody is dropping them nobody cares about the fur this has to be changed please add some use uh, i've seen some people su suggest that you could use this to repair the new perilous moon set that would be really damn cool as well because the gold price there um it feels a little bit it's it, it we'll talk about that later moving on let's talk about the moons of peril so this is the boss we'll talk a little bit about like the dungeon itself too but i'm not talking about the quest here just talking about the boss experience overall i consider it to be the most complete and developed piece of content it it feel it feels great i i feel like this honestly like i would almost wager that this was like legit the starting point of all of varlamore because it feels good it feels completed the setting is great. I just, I really, really love Perilous Moons. Everything about it was pretty damn good. Obviously, there's a couple issues. We'll get into that. But overall, I would consider this like a 9.5 out of 10. It was amazing. I really enjoyed that it worked as a social experience. You got to see other people. You get to kind of laugh at them when they make mistakes. But at the end of the day, it's still a solo encounter. Um, other people's mistakes don't punish you. It's not annoying to have other people, although there was an issue with the bosses kind of like flickering with too many people. Um, but yeah, other than that, I think it's great. Um, and like, if you want to, you could just turn on Entity Hider and it really feels like it's, you know, your own boss. So it's great. Prep actually felt very natural and quick. I was really worried about the prep at first because generally I hate prep when it comes to like Corrupted Gauntlet or Chambers of Zarek. Um, but it actually worked totally well. Um, it's also not entirely necessary. If you want to, you can bring your own items, but it, it became very clear to me that you should just go ahead and prep. I really like that you can um, prep as you go to the next room. You don't have to like sit, do a bunch of stuff, go back to the camp, cook all the stuff, and then go to the room. Um, I have this like kind of flow where when I do the blood guy and then I will catch lizards, but I'll bring those lizards to the blue moon and then cook them once I'm done with the blue moon. Same idea with the moths. You can kind of catch the moths as you go to the next area without like losing downtime. There's also a lot of different options. There's the fish and the lizard. Um, I really like the lizards because I like that you can like store them as a lizard form. It's more inventory efficient that way. Um, but the fish are also like kind of a cool AFK. And even though the mini game just like doesn't work for me, maybe I'm just trash at it. I still think that that fishing mini game was really cool. I hope they honestly add that to like I, I would add that to like every fishing spot. Honestly, that was I love the Jack and Daxter like move your fish. It's it's cool. Same idea. You could either catch. Or you could either like catch moths or you can make the potions to get your prayer. It's a little bit faster, I think, to catch the moths, but it does require the hunter level. There's also that other extra level of efficiency that I've talked about before where you can get 75 hunter to catch them, but you can go up to 85 hunter. And now uh, you don't need to have the butterfly net in your inventory, but you also don't need to switch to the butterfly net. It can be a little bit annoying managing your stuff. And I've definitely auto attacked the moon boss with a butterfly net before. So I'm like, damn, I should get 85 hunter. I would really like to see all the moths interactable or to just remove the cosmetic moths there's a lot of moths that just kind of exist to create this like swarm feeling but then like half of them are like invisible you can't actually click them i like that the prep allows you to get away with like a bit more damage from the bosses and uh kind of eats your resources a little bit more um because it already offers the supply so i think in the mid game and stuff like that it allows there to be a bit you know they're not overly punishing or anything but i definitely find myself eating quite a bit because, you know, I, I don't care. I, I don't mind eating when I'm already offered the supplies and it's not that hard to make them. Um, in addition, the gameplay loop feels really, really nice. You're kind of going right into the next cycle. Once you've killed the boss, you go right into the next boss. There's not a lot of downtime because it kind of teleports you right outside the doorway to the next one. Um, and when you finish a cycle, it you basically like start the new one right again. And, and I, I almost like that you're not put back in the lobby it's like it takes more time to leave than to go again. There's a lot of times where I'm like, uh, I said this would be my last one, but like, I don't want to run all the way. I just want to go do another one. So, yeah, I kind of created this like very addicting, nice loop. I do think, though, that in the lobby, it would be nice to have one of those like run energy. So you can you can get the cup of tea and restore your run energy because uh, there's a bit of a run from the bank to the first camp. And I usually end up having to like walk for part of it. Maybe my agility just sucks. That's probably my bad. Um, and I think this would be fine to just add one of those because if you do need to uh, go to the bank, maybe you forgot an item or you want to test something else out instead or you want to go do like a birdhouse run, etc. You have to reprep anyways um, unless you drop your stuff right outside. But yeah, you can't like... Yeah, there's all the bank is already far away, so why not just add a little bit of run energy there? So for the Blood Moon specifically, the defense progression is a really cool mechanic. It's kind of true of all of them, but I think it feels the most prevalent with the Blood Moon. 
Um, I really like this in the mid game because the progression steps are a lot more clear and there's a lot more of them compared to strength progression where um, I think it's very like there, there's only like a couple items like amulet strength, fighter torso, berserker ring, things like that. But um, I really enjoyed like looking for new defensive pieces. Like I was like, oh, I can get like a granite body here. Like, oh, maybe I should go grind like dragon play legs or something like that. Um, oh, wow. Maybe I should use an amulet of glory or like black boots instead of uh, climbing boots. Just like. It felt more fun for me to try to like max my defense instead. And then as I got like a bit better stats and as my clear started getting a little faster, I was like, okay, now I think I can invest a little bit more into damage because I'm not getting hit as hard. I also just want to say I did all of these as like a mid game hardcore Iron Man. I had about 75, 80 ish stats. So I think this is around the level. And I did most of them with like, I started off with like a rune plate body and rune plate, like things like that. I was not doing this in like full Torva and Scythe. The Blood Rain special is really cool. I really like it. I think you have plenty of time to dodge, walk around and stuff like that. And honestly, a lot of times it's easier to just kind of stand still. It's not too frantic. Sometimes though, I do spawn into rain. Um, there's usually like a bit of like, you get a bit of leeway when you first enter the instance, but for some reason for Blood Rain, it feels like I spawn and get hit by it right away. Maybe my reactions are really, really bad, but it just felt like uh, unfair. The Jaguar phase was kind of cool at first to like figure out the timing. You kind of have to step back to dodge a Jaguar hit and then get back. But I think it got really, really boring for me um, very, very fast because there's not really much upside to actually doing this properly. It would be really nice to damage the boss, like damage you do to the Jaguar also goes to the boss itself um because right now the only thing that actually happens is you're you're getting healed a little bit and it, it doesn't really feel like that much healing um honestly most of the time you're just better off eating anyways because like you have tons of food right like food is never the limiting factor so uh, i think if you could do damage to the boss there would instead be a trade-off like okay you you could eat right now but if you eat you're losing damage to the jaguar so instead do damage to the jaguar and just trust the healing that you get off of the jaguar as well this would actually reward you for having good timing and not making any mistakes and getting all your hits in. And it would also, um, it would actually, I think it would allow for the boss to do more damage because, well, you know, if he heals a little bit more, that's okay because you're getting a lot of damage done during this Jaguar phase if you play properly. The Jaguar phase is already like the toughest mechanical timing in my opinion it is pretty precise when you have to step back and stuff like that uh, and you get like really no reward for doing it um the healing is pretty minimal it's basically just do this over and over again so you don't take damage um and this is kind of like a general trend with all these bosses and my biggest downside with them is that there is too much downtime once you've acquired a bit of mastery where you're just kind of waiting around the blood moon healing is probably fine as is if you did this boss before the update you might disagree with me but they have recently changed the bosses in particular they have nerfed the healing by like 50 to 60 percent it's pretty massive um as it stands right now it still feels a bit longer than the other two but i think it's okay um and i really like that the healing has a very clear punishment for not bringing enough defense where if you're if if they're healing a lot that's on you that's because you're not bringing enough defense you probably want to bring a little bit more defense if you try to dps race this guy and do more damage uh, and bring like more you're never you're never going to beat him he heals too much you have to you know take it back a bit and bring some more defensive gear for the blue moon i really like the negative armor bonus of this guy if you don't know basically every time you get a hit it's going to deal like five more because it has like a negative five armor. This makes multi-hit weapons really, really cool. In particular, I really like that the dual uh, Makwa Weedles, however you say it, um, which is a drop from this, end up becoming like a really fun weapon. So as soon as you get it, you're like immediately able to go use it against the boss and uh, do some pretty crazy damage. They're also crush weapons, which this guy is weak to. So that was a very cool inclusion. Both the Tornadoes and the Ice Block for the Blue Moon have the same problem. Again, it's just way too much downtime and it's way too easy to get it done on time so um there's just a lot of time we're just sitting around like basically doing nothing just kind of sitting there with everybody else this is kind of the fatal flaw with like a group encounter that's done solo is that it has to be balanced around like the base level um in a typical fight you know if you had completed the ice block well the boss spawns and you're good to go but they can't assure that everybody's going to be absolutely perfect and get to their ice block in time and get every single hit in so they give you a little bit more leeway to make it easier for um you know newer players but if you already have that mastery uh there should be room for mastery of mechanics to feel rewarding and actually like you know give you a little bit more to do this isn't just for amazing or like good players who already know what they're doing but also for newer players to feel like oh now i'm getting this ice block a little bit faster here's my reward for doing that instead of well, why did I get better at this and, you know, learn to sneak in an extra hit when like 
I have 10 seconds. And I'm just sitting here doing nothing anyways. So I think instead of, uh, I think for the bonfires, instead of taking damage and healing, if you activate the bonfire, it should just do damage. That way, if you have faster pathing and you get through the tornadoes faster, you're doing more damage to the boss. You might think that this is a little bit unfair, but it already just takes a massive chunk of damage at the start of the phase and then heals it back up. Um, and then like you stop, I mean, you, you do stop the healing, but I think this would feel a little bit better if you just activate the bonfires and their damage starts like ticking down to me. I just, I think that would feel a bit more rewarding, even though I think at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of the same thing, but I think the mentality here is a little bit more, and it should also just do more damage to the boss. Uh, the faster you get it done. The ice block is probably okay, but I think there could also be some reward for completing it fast. Um, I think that they could give you like an immunity to the freeze debuff that the boss puts on you that makes you miss a hit or maybe some extra damage on your next hit based on how fast you complete it. Um, maybe they could just speed it up by a little bit and uh, the damage that you get for it is like very, very minimal. So it doesn't really feel that bad if you've already gone into 10%, but there's a bit more there. Um, or I think what might be nice is after you've gotten your weapon back, have like a fourth ice block that you can just, you know, go smack a little bit and like just, you know, once you got your weapon, okay, go hit this. You can get two or three hits in because you've like completed it fast. And I think that would make people feel a little bit better. Like, like once you've, you know, gone a little faster completing it, now here's your reward. You get a little bit of free damage that gets transferred to the boss um, eventually. Finally, for this guy's like defense debuff or whatever, where he freezes you, it doesn't feel really, really clear um, compared to the blood guy where it's like, oh, yeah, I'm taking damage right now. He's healing. I need more defense. I think this guy just like makes you miss an attack or something or like slows down your attack speed or something like that. I, I don't know. Just it took me a while to understand. And um, I still don't know exactly what it does. It just feels like sometimes I just sit there kind of frozen. OK, the Eclipse Moon. Um, once again, I think the armor stat actually works here. In this in this case, he has a pretty massive armor stat. I think it's six. So that means all your hits are lowered by six. Um, so that's why you feel you might feel like you're doing a lot less damage to him. Um, and I think this kind of rewards you to bring like a slower weapon instead, because obviously slower weapons are not going to be impacted by it as much. The first special, a moon shield, is kind of just like an intermission where you're really doing absolutely nothing. And the boss becomes this like my turn, your turn. You know, this is your turn where I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. Um, you can't really speed it up. You can't like sneak in extra hits or do anything better at all. Um, it's literally just walk in a line for a little bit just to prove that you know how to do it again this is fun for like the first 10 to 20 but then it very quickly becomes like ah oh, damn it this phase again and i'm just sitting here doing nothing um one corner just straight up doesn't work you're like basically guaranteed to get hit on the first corner that you pass uh i just i don't know why um i do think though it's a cool way to like reuse the shield mechanic of like zuck and also kind of teaching you to like walk and stuff like that walking is something that is um, not used very much outside of like Vorkath and a little bit at Zuck. So uh, it, it's a cool it's a cool thing. I just wish that it wasn't so boring. I wish there was like something you could do. I almost wish that like you could bring like a range swap or something and do damage while you're ranging. That way, like there's a little bit extra that you could get done there. Now, the second special is completely different. This is the after images or like the mimic phase where he summons copies and you have to face them. This is honestly by far the most fun special even after you know, like 200 kills, it still feels really damn good. You're actually rewarded for playing right without being overly punished for making mistakes. So if you miss it, I think you only take like 10 to 15 damage. It's not too bad. It's easy enough to get the timing right, but it's not entirely brain dead. There is a certain timing. I still miss it every now and then if I'm being lazy or not like paying attention. So I kind of like that. You still have to get the timing right and like get the spam clicks right. But be, by, by doing it right, you get to hit the boss back and do a crazy amount of damage. You actually do so much damage during that phase that it almost feels like you're damage outside of that phase doesn't really matter as a result um i had this moment where i was like aha i should be bringing a slow weapon that makes sense and that, again that works with the armor thing where slow weapons don't get punished by the you know flat damage reduction um and i brought my bgs and i was like destroying this guy in one phase i felt really really damn good i think a lot of people will make this um, realization on their own without necessarily needing a guide they'll just think like oh dude i could bring like a slow weapon here because i'm attacking every single time anyways that being said the special does last a little bit too long um and you just end up doing way more damage inside that phase and outside of it so uh with no way to get out early this can cause a lot of problems um because there's not really a reliable way of getting out unless you're using some stuff like multi-hit weapons which again don't always work you know, so like I've seen that like Darok sometimes will just overkill him and just push the phase. If that doesn't happen, he just gets stuck at like one HP and you have to sit there for the entire phase, just like 
click, 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 click. And at that point, you're not getting any reward and it does feel bad. Um, it's just like all the other specials that we talked about. They're boring, slow, intermission, nothing you can really do about it. And you're just basically waiting for your turn to do damage, which sucks, especially if the boss is at like one HP or like five HP going into it. And you're like, oh my God. The Eclipse Moon is the worst at this because I don't know if this is a bug or something, but it feels like the boss goes like invulnerable at low health where it like i think when the boss gets like below 10 hp it feels like my attacks only do one damage like they just stop hitting the boss entirely and i don't know if this is i just don't know why I, i've tried to figure out what this is um but as a result this almost always leads to an extra like special phase which are again slow and boring when at one hp and it's like i'm basically just praying i'm praying 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 that i can get that final one hit i've actually started to uh slow down my last attack to the last possible second because the boss puts himself down to one hp and then you try to go for like the killing blow because yeah it's really really frustrating without that um i don't know why this happens the others don't work like this at all i've gotten more consistent kills oh also the eclipse defense mechanic this is where you'll glance off their shield I have no idea what this does. I, I I thought that this was the boss going invulnerable thing, but um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure how it works. Okay, for the rewards, I think that all the sets feel fine and they actually have uh, some place in the meta. The Blood Moon set, Blue Moon set, and the Eclipse set. That's what I'm kind of talking about here. Um, also, I know a lot of people don't really like the looks of it. I don't really care about that, so i um, not going to complain about that. I do think that the level 75 requirement is a little bit steep. Um, it's like 75 range, 75 magic, 75 strength. That feels a little bit up there considering that like Bandos only requires like 65 defense to use and no strength requirement. Armadillo only requires 70 armor to use. So yeah, 75 range feels a little bit high. I'm not sure. I feel like that could have been level 70 pretty easily. I really like the weapons. All three of them feel pretty damn good. And I like that they're usable without the set and that they're non-degradable, meaning that uh, if you can't use a set or if you don't have the set, just the weapons alone are pretty damn awesome. Um, and you can go ahead and use them for, you know, whatever you want. It's not like you need the set to make the weapon happen um, like you would in the case of like Crystal Armor and Bofa, where it's you kind of need the whole set to make it work. The weapons are pretty damn good. For the armor set, it's not prohibitively expensive. Um, I know a lot of people were worried about the cost at first, um, but apparently it lasts a lot longer than people thought. Uh, but it does kind of feel that way where it's like, damn, this is an expensive repair. It's one and a half million to repair the full gear. Um, I think this is lowered with a smithing level, but... You know, at this point in the game, you're probably not like 99 smithing. So even if it's only like one mil, it, it still feels like quite a bit that you have to pay. And this is especially true because there's no way of partial charging gear. So if your gear hits zero, that is a big price that you're going to have to pay. You know, three pieces, that's going to be, you're looking at like four and a half million right there. At this stage in the game, around this like level 75 mark, four and a half million is not something you just have sitting around in your bank ready to go, which, um, you know, it's not like a shadow or it's not like a, one of the powered staffs or something like that, where like if you run out of stuff, you could put in like, you know, a thousand charges of it or something like that. Uh, no, to repair armor, you have to fully repair it. And um, even if that ends up being like, you know, three mil or something because you have a high smithing level, that's still a lot of money to like use it. I also think that for mid game, it's very difficult to accept the use money to make money like mentality because you're still training. You're not being super, super efficient. Um, and I know for a lot of people it's difficult to get in the mindset of like, oh, yeah, I'm just always, always going to be losing money and then I'm going to make that money doing other things. So uh, personally, I think that this cost should probably go down quite a bit. Um, I don't think it even needs to be degradable, honestly. But if they are going to make it happen, either make it degradable or sorry, either make it cheaper or have something else that you can do instead to recharge it. The uh, flat gold price just feels a little bit too much. One thing I don't like about the sets, though, um, this probably would get them into the level of like overpowered if it was functional with the Slayer Helm. But yeah, it kind of sucks that you can't use any of the sets with uh, a Slayer Helmet on. Um, it would be really damn nice for that. If you can do undeads, you could technically use like a um, you could use like a Salve Amulet, I guess, for that. So there's a couple of options, like maybe you're doing like Ankus or something like that. But for the most part, unfortunately, no, you're going to have to go ahead and use, you know, your Slayer Helm. The dual Mukko Weedles feels really damn strong. I kind of tested it out quite a bit, ran some DPS stuff with it, and it felt better than the Zombie Axe in a lot of cases. Um, yeah, this weapon is damn strong to the point where I'm a, a little bit worried that it almost feels kind of bad that the Zombie Axe like just came out. And that was already a pretty big step up. And now this new weapon comes out. It's like, oh, damn, this thing's even more good. Um, but I think the progression now does feel pretty good between like Dragon Simi, Zombie Axe, uh, Dual Mako Weedles, and then uh, Abyssal Whip once you get up to like 
you know, a little bit higher and stuff like that. The Blue Moon Spear, I know a lot of people are kind of trashing on it, but I actually think it's a great upgrade over the Ancient Staff. Um, if you're trying to do any kind of bursting, it provides 5% bonus damage, bonus magic damage, which is not very easy to get at, you know, that stage in the game and like this early mid game kind of area. The only kind of like fatal flaw with it is that it doesn't actually remember what your attack style was on. So it doesn't remember your spell cast. It always goes back to like a default attack style every single time you switch weapons. So this is especially true because when you're bursting, you'll swap to darts to actually round them all up. And then you put the spear back on and you're like stabbing them instead of uh, casting ice burst or whatever. This is a really, really bad thing. I know a lot of people are like, damn, you know what? Screw it. I'll just use ancient staff. I'll take the 5% damage hit because it is pretty damn annoying uh it should probably be fixed as soon as possible the athlotl i don't know how to say that right i see it as kind of like a cheaper blowpipe especially for iron men who it's a little harder to get a blowpipe um but the real cool benefit of it, of it is that it allows for um bonus strength gear for your range stuff which first off gives you easier swaps so that if you're doing something like demonic gorillas or toa um and you are struggling with bringing too many swaps okay well you can just use your strength gear and then switch to ranged um just you just need to put on the weapon basically um, it also allows you to use things like a Berserker Ring, a Fire Cape. You probably wouldn't use a Fire Cape. You'd probably use an Ava's. Uh, Amulet of Strength, Dragon Boots, things like that as a way of getting bonus strength damage because bonus range damage, it, it comes in like really late. It's why range has a very weird progression curve. You kind of feel like garbage and then like you get really, really strong at the late game once you get all the really like, like good late game stuff towards the end. I do think it's a bit hard to rate sets which have set effects because this is like a pretty novel thing to old school RuneScape surprise. I, I think it's a good experiment to just test it out and see how it kind of works and if people like it. One thing that, you know, kind of I'm a little bit curious about is like how much will it limit getting like individual piece upgrades? So, for example, let's say I'm using the Blood Moon set and I get like Bandos Tacits. Well, now it's like, oh, I, I like Bandos Tacits. I want to use Bandos Tacits. But like, is that set bonus so valuable that I would rather not break set and not get new upgrades, which I think a lot of the game is kind of around, you know, getting these new upgrades and feeling good with every single new piece. The secondary rewards from the Lunar Chest at the end are absolutely fantastic for Iron Man. Um, you're getting like really good stuff. I really like the uh, clay that you get, but it's not that appealing for like a regular main account. There's just not that many drops. The water orbs aren't that cool. Super combos isn't that cool. Um, Herolanders aren't that cool. Um, the only one that I think is really nice is U seeds because they actually go for a decent amount and they also are good for Iron Man as well. It's like free farming experience. And I'd like to see like one or two like similar drops at the level of U seeds that just they just kind of feel a little bit nicer for regular accounts. Um, in particular, I think Ranars instead of Irits would have been kind of cool. Like just it doesn't have to be all the time, but like maybe like 20% of the time you get like a Ranar or like a like a snapdragon or like a snapdragon seed i don't know just like it's just like a little bit bonus on on the secondary stuff and then maybe every now and then you get some ultra compost instead of super again just like as like a ooh, i got the this time because yeah i felt like at a certain point you're like oh yeah i'm getting the exact same job every single time and um you're just kind of like siphoning it off into like pretty bear cash the slayer monsters are a really welcome addition to this like dungeon i think it gives it a little bit more like life and flavor and it feels like a complete area not just like let me run through these empty hallways going from boss to boss to boss uh, i really appreciate there not being any silly percentage to get like the maximum barrows chest i'm actually uh dreading finding out that maybe you do have to actually kill like two sulfur nagua to get like the maximum rewards i'm just begging that this isn't the case uh the sulfur nagua in particular are absolutely crazy experience um because they have that negative armor and you can like camp prayer against them because you, you get like all the potions you could want this feels a little bit like rough because I think it's encroaching on Scurrius that just came out and and Scurrius was kind of designed as this like new combat training method, but now they added Sulfur Nagra, which are also like a really good combat training method. And I think it even has like better drops. So I, uh, I'm not sure how this will shake up the meta, but like right now my idea is like basically rush 48 Slayer and just farm the heck out of these Nagwas because damn they give you can get some I've got some pretty crazy experience rates I don't know what you would get like right at 50 compared to like Scurrius but uh yeah that's I, I think to be to be seen in the future the sulfur essence that you get from the Nagra doesn't I don't think it has to evaporate um uh, basically if you don't know they'll occasionally drop these essence which you can redeem for like 50 rune crafting but if you accidentally leave the dungeon it all goes away so you have to remember to go to like the um 
AS Lolly at the end and turn it in. And I've I think I've thrown away like over ten thousand in crafting essence doing this, which doesn't really seem necessary. I also think that the Nagua are way too rare of a Slayer monster. They only show up on Konar and uh, Cheldar's table, and they're like the worst possible way. They're very, very, very rare. I don't know why they're so damn rare. Um, I think these could both be a lot more common and make some of the earlier Slayer Masters feel a little bit better. If you're already at like Neve or if you're already at like Duradel, okay, yeah, we probably don't need this monster. But like Banaka, Jeldar, like, I think it'd be a really cool, like, common Slayer monster to get where you're like, oh, damn, it's Sulfur Naga, let's freaking like slam experience. Obviously, there would probably be really, really good Slayer experience as well. But like, I, I think that's probably, it's probably okay to add them as like a decent Slayer monster. I like the Wormlings a lot. These are basically a good alternate to Worms. I used to kind of hate Worms. I used to always treat them as like a skip or a block. And now it's kind of like, especially when, before you have like your full block list set up and you want to do Worms, but you don't really care about like the money or the bones and stuff like that. Uh, now you have an alternate. You can just quickly go do the Wormlings, get it done uh, pretty damn fast and move on. I, I like that. I like the alternate. It feels good. And it's in general, it's a fun way to do Slayer with like prayers and potions. I'm uh, very much on the train right now where I think flicking Slayer kind of sucks. And uh, I'm currently going through a bit of a renaissance in my life where i realize that i don't have to flick i can just make prayer potions and uh you know play the game as it was intended and just camp prayer the whole time and chug like crazy perilous moons is amazing i love it okay let's talk about the coliseum <laughs> again i want to preface that this is probably the content i engage the least with i have not completed the coliseum i haven't even gotten close i think the best i've done is like i think i got wave five done um, I do want to say, though, that I have completed the Inferno, so it's not like I'm a complete noob at this, and that's why I can't engage with it. I just wasn't that interested in it um, on my main. I've also been playing my Iron Man a lot, which just isn't at the level, so um, that's partially the reason as well. I don't want to completely throw this content away. Regardless, if you think I'm unworthy to have an opinion, that's totally fine. You can ignore or just skip my opinion on this. That's I, I don't I don't blame you. I think it's fair. It's a fair criticism to say, hey, how are you judging this if you haven't even completed it yet? That's understandable. There's much smarter people and much better PVM players that have their opinions as well. That being said, I think the Coliseum feels very undercooked and definitely a little bit rushed. If not, there was a lot of cut content to make the release date um i think that they hyped up the coliseum a lot as sort of the opener for varlamore and i think it would have probably been better to put it like two months more uh in the oven and let it kind of fully fledge out because the current state of the coliseum just um it doesn't really live up to i think my expectations and and to be fair those expectations are pretty damn high because you know you are following up after the inferno which i think many consider to be the single best piece of content uh, runescape has ever received for me personally and this might be my own kind of problem but i expected something that was a little bit different as far as a wave based mini game that was a bit more dynamic and less about pillar solves i think especially when they talked about like moving terrain and stuff like that which didn't make the final cut i'm not that worried about that but to me at least the feeling that i got was that they wanted to move away from you're standing behind a pillar and there's an entire army at the other side of the pillar and you have you know all the time in the world to sit there and figure out how you want to run uh, out of the pillar and figure that out um for me personally, the part that I really enjoyed about the Inferno when I was completing my cape um, was I really enjoyed the start of the wave when you have that split second. How do I figure this out? Where do I go? Um, and that instant where you're like, uh, where you just realize like I have to deal with two mobs at once. I can't just run behind a pillar. To me, it almost felt like the same experience you might get when you're like, like dropping into like a half pipe or um, I don't know. You're just like, it's, it's that feeling of like, you're in the moment. You have to commit to your own experience and just start prayer flicking the blob and the mage. And once the snake moves, you move there that I absolutely loved. And I don't think that the infer, or I don't think the Coliseum has been as good about that. It feels more about complicated pillar solves that are, they are much more complicated. So if you like that, um, but yeah, that's why I call it kind of like jokingly. It's like an, it's kind of like an inferno too, with more complicated pillar solves, basically, where um, you have like you know six different monsters that you got to deal with. Overall, I think the mobs are very generic and very boring. They could literally be boiled down to this is the major mob, this is the ranger mob, 
This is the melee mob. This is another major mob. They also look very generic, especially I think the Javelin Colossus and the Shockwave Colossus just don't look that good. Um, the only monster in there that I really personally liked was the Manticore as well as the Minotaur. Minotaur just looks really damn awesome. He's a big beefy guy. And I really like the Manticore because he has like a unique attack thing where um, they attack you with three different attacks, almost like Leviathan-esque. Um, but you can see it. You can predict it. When there's two of them attacking you, they won't attack you at the same time. It's on a 10-tick cycle, so it actually lines up with other monsters attacking you. Um, and something I miss about the Manticore compared to the Inferno is that there were no rules of the mobs. And what I mean by, like, rules in the Inferno is that every single mob, I think, in the Inferno had, like, its own little, like, unique thing going on with it. Bats would, like, drain your stats, so you had to try to safe spot them and uh, take them down fast. Blobs obviously had like the little mobs that spawned after, so you had to deal with those mobs. Melees would dig to you, so that was always something you had to consider. You always had to be planning like, okay, this dig is coming. Um, and they kind of do that with the reinforcements, but I think it's a little bit more boring because the mobs themselves are just way more generic. And then you also have this like massive like mini game with the majors where uh, mages can respawn in the Inferno. And when you first start the Inferno, you let the wave respawn like every single time. But as you get a little bit better, as you get a little bit more experience, you start thinking like, oh, I can take like this a little bit more advanced strat to, you know, kill the mage while flicking the blob, even though like I could kill the blob safely. But no, I'm just going to kill the mage first because it's going to speed things up. And and I just don't really see that as much in the Inferno. Um, or sorry, I don't see that as much in the Coliseum. It feels, you know, it, it feels like you can take, like, the safe option. It's, like, almost always the correct option. Um, and, like, there's not as much, like, I guess, freedom, I think, in risking it until you get to, like, some of the really, really high levels. And and, and I don't want to, like, I don't want to disrespect the people who are uh, putting in the work. Some of the crazy speed runs I've seen, some of the crazy challenges I've seen, those guys are absolutely crazy. I think they're actually loving the Coliseum because it is really fun when you take it to that, like, absolute crazy level. But I think the uh, progression from sort of like a, you know, somebody stepping into the Coliseum to, like, completing the Coliseum, just, it's not as interesting to me as the Inferno, which I think teaches you uh, so many cool different, like, fundamentals and, and you get that, like, mastery a little bit more. Um, I could be wrong. Again, I haven't completed the Coliseum, so you know you could disregard everything I say. What I do feel pretty confident, though, is that there is very little to no atmosphere in the uh, Coliseum. It feels very empty. I think this is actually a byproduct of uh, making the Coliseum so big. I know that this is what they kind of sold as like a plus, like, oh, there's going to be this massive big Coliseum. But uh, as it turns out, I think making it really big and feel really, really empty with no crowd, uh, it's not like this crazy cheering. There's not this hype as the stakes get higher. Um, it just makes it feel very like bland and boring, almost like you're in this like separate little like, I don't know, like training room area. <laughs> and I think this could also be attested to the music. I don't think that the music in the Coliseum is bad. I just think that it's very underwhelming compared to the Inferno or even the Fight Caves. I will say this might be nostalgia. Maybe the Coliseum will grow on me, but like right now, I think the Inferno music is just, it's its on a different level where it, it kind of gets my heart rate going, gets me like pumped, like I feel like I'm in this like tough challenge and I just don't feel that in the Coliseum. I, I feel like I need a little bit more of like a pounding beat that like drives me to keep going. Okay, Invocations, this is kind of a big one. Um, it's definitely, I think, what makes the Coliseum more unique from like the Inferno and stuff like that. Uh, and I think the goal with creating um, these Invocations that you get to pick, which are basically debuffs, is to create varied different runs so that no two runs are the same and you kind of have to work your way through the different debuffs and you know overcome the different challenges. In practice, I don't think this was achieved. I think most people just kind of have an optimal combo that they're sort of fishing for and they look for the invocations that don't have a major impact, things that are inconsequential to the runs. The flip side there is that when you get stuff that does mess up your run, that does mess up your strategy, you're gonna reset and uh, basically just go again. They would need to have a lot, a lot more uh, invocations. I'm talking like 30 plus or so to really make it varied where there's just like every single run just feels very, very different. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. I think right now it's basically just there's good ones and there's bad ones. You've reset when you get the bad ones and keep going with the good ones. Obviously, if you're a very, very good player, you can go with anything and that's understandable. But if you're when you're just going for your first completion, um, I don't think most people are challenging themselves with like the worst possible combo and like finding the, you know, heart in them to like fight through. Mainly I'm talking about the Doom, the Doom Scorpion and the Bees. These are hard passes and I think a lot of people feel that way like it just I like you would rather reset than do runs with these cuz god they're really really annoying. 
I do think these could be balanced. They don't necessarily have to be removed. But as they stand right now, like, man, these guys suck. One thing that really is kind of weird with the invocations is that some of them are very different in terms of, like, power level based as to, like, when when you get them in the wave. So, like, let's say you get one on wave 2 versus you get it on, like, wave 12 or, like, wave 11. It's very different as to how good at it, it is. Um, and as a result, you know, getting bad stuff very, very early means you're going to have to deal with it for the entirety of the run. Um, and because the runs are so short, at the end of the day, like, you know, a typical run is probably going to be, like, you know, Maybe your first run is probably going to be 40 minutes to an hour or so. Um, because these runs are so much shorter than the Inferno, you might as well reset if you're feeling like you get bad luck rather than like forcing yourself to like suffer. Um, and, and I don't think that feels good when you're trying to get your first completion and you're like, damn, dude, like I'm on wave 10. This is like my best. And I got like freaking bees or something like that. Or I got like the Doom Scorpion. And now it's like, man, this like sucks. Obviously, you have a choice here, but, um, you know, it is possible to get three bad choices. <laughs> it's, it's not like... That's not out of the question. It happens quite a bit. Now, the flip side to having debuffs is maybe there should be buffs to compensate. Um, I don't know if we necessarily need to have something absolutely crazy, like, you know, like make it turn into leagues where, you know, you have like a two tick shadow and all that stuff. Probably not necessary. Um, but I do think like something that might be interesting is maybe there was like one buff at the start of every single run that you could choose. And, you know, maybe, maybe like you could just choose, maybe there's like five of them and you get to choose one of them. And they just change things a little bit. Maybe you heal a little bit every time you kill a mob or, uh, you know, maybe you do a little bit more damage with every attack. So something like a blowpipe might be uh, viable. And I think that having that one little buff that you get to choose and you get to prep for could open up a little bit of more strategies. Maybe you want to do a melee setup and there's something that works there. Maybe you want to do a range setup. There's something that works there. And I think this could be a nice way of sort of alleviating some of the, I guess, pressure of just like every single wave. It's more and more and more like, like annoying devos being added. Now, my personal favorite solution that I would like to see for this kind of stuff, because now we've had, uh, we've actually had two, you know, big pieces of content, Tombs of a Masket, and now the Coliseum that use invocations. But for something like the Coliseum, I actually think that the system would be a lot better with no invocations at all to start off with. So there are no debuffs that you go. And instead, this would actually be an optional self-imposed challenge to enable at the start. And uh, maybe instead of getting it every wave, maybe you could just start wave one and it's like okay which ones do you want to start this with because you're going to go with all of them all the way through they already talked about having like an endless mode um, where people could keep going and keep collecting debuffs so i don't think the idea of having like an impossible challenge is out of the question it actually feels like something that was cut content and to me i like this a little bit more because there is an end game there is there is an actual like final objective and that's to like complete the Coliseum with every single one enabled as opposed to, okay, well, how many endless waves can you go until you like basically get bored or run out or like make a mistake? I understand that this might make the normal Coliseum too easy. Uh, personally, I don't think that's the case. I think a lot of people would obviously still struggle because pillar solves are quite difficult uh, all on their own. But if they really want to do that, they can instead make it so that the quiver requires heat 10. I'm kind of borrowing the term from Hades, which does this. And it's the same idea. At the beginning of every Hades run, you'll pick which uh, heat you want to turn on. And um, all those challenges will essentially add up and, and make it more difficult over time. And then you're constantly pushing for higher and higher and higher heat, which makes the run a little harder. I think this would allow people to actually learn the waves and get their like like start you know dipping their toes in the content in a somewhat consistent manner even the first like five or six waves they change massively based on what um invocations you start off with and then you could expand on that skill set and test themselves in ways that click for them maybe um the minotaur with the red flag maybe you feel really good about that and you feel confident with dealing with the melee you could turn that one on um or if that one's really difficult for you okay screw it let's put on uh, the double duo and we can get the shockwave or maybe we could turn frailty on, things like that. You can you can start working your way up to some of the harder heats and challenge yourself more and more and more. Um, I think this would be a nicer way to create that repetition, uh, even more so than something like the Inferno, where once you complete it once, I think you, know, you wanna go back and you wanna do the Inferno again. You wanna prove your mastery over the content, uh, but there's not really a reason to there. I think this would give it an alternate reason. And perhaps higher heat will also increase the chance of rewards so that people who are capable, you know, incredible gamers who are doing this at like max heat or whatever, they can really get some of the best gold um, in the entire game. I know that um, RuneScape 3 actually does this where, you know, the hardest PVM content in the game will absolutely juice you gold. Um, and I think that should be a fair reward for people who can do, you know, the best content in the game. Okay, Soul Heredit. I have not done this boss, so he looks really cool, and I don't know what else to say about him. Um, 
that's it. I think a lot of people have said that he's one of the coolest bosses in the game. I definitely agree. I think he looks really damn awesome, and I would really like to try him out. Um, one thing I do want to say, though, is I think it would be really cool to have a wave-based minigame like the Inferno or the Coliseum that actually has more than one bosses for you to take on because, god damn, dude, the bosses are really cool. Jad and Zuck are both so damn iconic, and Sola is also really damn cool. And so I think, like, imagine if this minigame had actually been 15 waves with a boss at 5, 10, and 15, and uh, maybe you get a buff after completing, you know, every single one of these bosses. You might think that's a crazy idea. Uh, I'm just stealing from what originally was proposed with like the blue inferno task all trials. That's actually what was proposed at first. So um, yeah, that would be really cool. We should definitely try that out sometime. That'd be really awesome. Okay, for the rewards of the Colosseum, the goal here, and this is exactly what they said, was to encourage player to try their hands at the runs even if they can't, you know, complete the whole thing. They want people to go in and be able to uh, get loot even from the earlier waves. And then uh, this technically worked out, but I don't think this panned out exactly how they planned on it. Um, and that's because wave one is uh, so damn good. You can get 100 Sunfire Splinters and the demand for Sunfire Splinters is insane right now. You need 150K to actually like corrupt your quiver. So damn, there's a lot of demand for Sunfire Splinters because a lot of people are getting a hands on uh, quiver right now. Now wave one can be done in like, a minute and you can get like 100k for the sunfire splinters meaning you can make like six mil an hour right now just farming wave one resetting starting again resetting starting again resetting and uh the thing is that wave one is so so much easier than wave two plus that not only is wave one just insane money right now but it just feels like everything past wave one is just not really worth doing for money um i don't know how much gold like the most efficient like if you put like the best like Coliseum player right now. I don't know how much gold per hour they would be making, but I would not be surprised if it was significantly less than what somebody with like a rune plate body could farm doing wave one. It's it's actually insane. Another thing that's kind of rough here is that uh uniques seem to start at wave seven. So this means that if you're not able to get to wave seven, you don't even have a chance at getting uh, any of the uniques. You have to be able to actually get to wave seven, complete wave seven. And even then that's, that's maybe like one roll because if you get to like wave eight and that's too hard, you know, you're really kind of stretching how much you're getting there. Uh, this is really, really tough because um, I don't know this for sure because I haven't only made it to wave six. I haven't made it past wave six. Uh, again, I haven't tried that much. So listen, I'll get it. Okay. Wave six is considered by many to be one of the harder waves in the entire Colosseum. There's uh, quite a bit going on, meaning that one of the harder waves is actually gating you to get to the uniques. And I think uh, a lot of people probably might have what happened to me where you get to wave six and you're like, oh, damn, this is kind of hard. This is pretty damn difficult. Uh, so you can't get wave six, you can't get wave seven. So you're not getting any single uniques. Um, and basically, if I was to just complete five waves, right, like wave five, I'm not really getting anything except like a couple Alks. Might as well just go ahead and farm wave one for the Sunfire Splinters. So, yeah, I'm not really getting to try out the runs at all. I like the fact that, you know, the loot is available on the line and you can kind of leave. But I do think it kind of creates a problem where you might feel disincentivized from trying harder waves because every time you get to like that hard wave that's like gating you so like wave six you're going to just take your money and go if you're trying to go there for money it feels like the money aspect only starts to come in once you've actually been able to complete the wave um or you're just farming like basically just wave one right now or or you're honestly just doing something else if they do end up like nerfing wave one so yeah i think they need to just make like they need to start giving you better rewards as early as like wave three or wave four i think and then like gradually stepping that up uh, i think the the actual rewards they come on too late and what's even worse is that well the rewards are fairly irrelevant too the uniques are just not that good uh, as far as i know they're mostly being used right now to fill up your death coffers because you can buy them for cheaper than death kind of offers you so you're getting like a huge discount on all of your deaths um, which is by the way another problem with the uh coliseum the 500k death fee is quite a massive gap it feels very punishing when you're already spending a ton of time and you're already spending a ton of resources for every single run Having to also pay 500k is like, damn, that is really, really taxing. I don't think that needed to be there. It's different than a boss where like you're not sending attempt after attempt to get further. So I don't think you can compare it to like a regular boss. Okay, so talking about some of the uniques, the Sunfire Fanatic gear was explicitly said it was designed to be reasonable, easy to obtain even at lower waves. 
Uh, it, it is not. I don't think you can get it before wave seven. And I think I saw a picture of somebody with 47 soul uh, heredit and not one Sunfire item. So yeah, 47 full completions and they did not hit a single Sunfire item. That's uh, pretty damn insane. So yeah, I don't know. Sunfire, sun, the Sunfire Fanatic gear feels way rarer than it ought to be, especially because cons like if you think about it, Sunfire is just, pr it's just prayer gear. It's an upgrade to Proselyte and that's relatively like mid and like early late game content. End game players who are making like you know millions off a of boss and they're farming the Coliseum, you probably don't really need prayer bonus. You're probably going to be okay just camping, you know, your best melee or your best combat stats and just chugging prayer. So, uh, who is this for exactly? And it's definitely not players like farming wave seven confidently. So, uh, yeah, it's just a bit of a mismatch there. Whereas I think that if Sunfire dropped like reliably at wave three, four, five, six, that would actually give me reason because. I'm not going to lie, even if you're kind of bad at this game, you could probably get wave three done. I think you could, honestly. And that would actually be some incentive to get in there and start farming it. So yeah, that's why I say it should be obtainable pretty early to actually encourage people to start off and try to get those first early couple of waves done. Okay, next up, the Glaive and the Echo Crystal. Honestly, I don't even know what to say about these because I don't really know what you even use these for. The Glaive, <laughs> I think it's really bad from everything I've seen. I don't know. I don't have a good opinion of these. They look kind of useless, useless right now. Um, also, I don't know why they're called the Tanal Sticks. I tried to look up what Tanal Sticks are, and I couldn't find it anywhere. So I don't know if this is a made-up word or, like, some really, really foreign word. But wh why, like, I feel like it should just be the Glaive. I <laughs> I don't know why we need to have items that are, like, impossible to say for no reason. Yeah, I think Glaive of Rallis was really damn good. I don't know why they changed that. That's very strange. Again, minor issue. Okay, so here's kind of my final, I guess piece of criticism and that's the big missing piece this is why i have not really felt like playing very much varlamore on my main and i think why for a lot of people i think they're either already checked out of varlamore or they're slowly starting to realize that like hey there's not that much for me to do here and that's that there's lack of content for late game players so this is people who have basically done the quest cape are farming some of these late game bosses uh but aren't quite at that pinnacle level um, of Colosseum. I do consider Colosseum to be pretty end game or pinnacle content, uh, comparable with like the Inferno. Yeah, but it's a step up, I think, compared to things like, you know, Expert TOA. It's a step up compared to like the Desert Treasure 2 bosses. There's, there's, it's harder. You know, you gotta, I think you have to definitely be a bit more of a gamer to do those. And that, that can feel like a bit of a gap for people. Outside of that, Perilous Moons is mainly mid game content and very good for Iron Man. Uh, again, the Colosseum feels very much end game it's one of the hardest pieces of content in the game i think could be wrong um and it's just not worth farming full clears compared to wave one it's not worth getting half clears because again you're not really getting any items and uh most importantly there's not really any new gear to strive for outside of the quiver i think if you're like a late game player there's not really a new weapon the 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 um glaive is bad the sunfire gear you probably don't really need so it's basically like okay do i want to commit to doing the quiver well, I guess I could, but a lot of people are already not committing to getting their Inferno, like Inferno capes. So, um, yeah, yeah, you know, it's it's it kind of feels bad. I feel like the uh, I, I think if anything, this has convinced more people that like it's time to buckle up and go do the Inferno than uh, to go and do the Coliseum. For the scaling methods, it's mid game thieving, pretty much mid game prayer. You're, if you're like seventy seven or like eighty prayer, you're probably not doing a lot of like calcified rocks. So it's mid game mining. Um, you don't like by this point in your account, you probably don't need to be training these methods. I mean, you could, but it's not like it's not like really the biggest drive. Uh, and so I really feel like the only like good piece of content for somebody who's like more or less like probably getting close to like 2000 total level or so is the new hunter guild, um, which is really, really cool. And I like it. There is some new end game hunter, uh, but that's about it. And in general, you know, you don't really need to train hunter. It's not really like any crazy new items that are added with hunter, except I guess the meat. But um, that's about it. So that is, I think, what is causing me at least probably the most hesitation is I just don't really see a reason right now to be playing my main. And I haven't really felt like doing anything on my main. Um, I think that the single piece of thing, like the single piece of content I would have loved to see would have been to have one more boss. And I know that's asking for a lot because there's already a lot of content. Um, but yeah, I think one more boss on release to farm. So this would be some, you know, a, a single like, easy to farm boss not easy to farm but it would be you know something similar to like the desert Tre treasure 2 bosses something like zora or vorkath you know just a new standalone boss that you go farm and uh there's some loot to be had maybe some new weapons or just something to look for that you can personally go and farm while the insane players are off doing the coliseum basically 
Um, I think that this might be the upcoming group boss. Maybe that's going to fill that gap. So I'm uh, I'm optimistic and I'm kind of hoping for it, but I don't really know that much about the group boss. And again, group boss is a little scary because I don't know what a group boss is actually going to end up feeling like. So yeah, I'm just, I'm. this is basically the one thing that I, I think would have like kind of wrapped up the game uh, or wrapped up the expansion and made it feel a little bit more complete and given me like just something new to you know, start working towards. Okay, this went way longer than I hoped it would. So um, I guess just to wrap up my thoughts, I pretty much said everything I want to, but um, yeah, Varlmore is absolutely great. I, I, again, I really, really do like it. I think it was a really ambitious project and I think they absolutely delivered on it. Um, I don't necessarily mind a big update like this, but I do think that it's not an excuse to have it be a little bit rushed. And I think the biggest thing I worry about is that I don't, Again, I said a lot of this stuff is unfinished and it needs a little bit more work. I hope that they actually do address that and not just kind of run to the next set of stuff. So like part two introduces like the agility or the herbler and then the Coliseum just ends up kind of sitting there like kind of waiting for stuff. And maybe we don't see fixes for it for like another year or two. And I think I think that's going to kind of leave people feeling a little bit like under like a bit um there's a little bit like more for uh, improvement, basically, for some of this early stuff. And that's why I kind of bring it up. Um, overall, I'm still having an insane amount of fun. Again, I've done most of this content as like a mid-game iron. So it literally feels absolutely perfectly catered to me. And I love it for that. Um, but I just can't shake the feeling that on my main, I am still hoping for a little bit Varlamore. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you guys in the next video.